I got a phone call from a friend of mine who works for the government, and he said, um, you have to get involved in this spin. It happened on April 20th, 2010, 41 miles off the coast of Louisiana. It's going to change your career. It's going to define every part of the rest of your life. You have to get in the game and get down here. Tragically, the explosion killed 11 and changed the lives of millions living near the Gulf Coast, as well as hundreds of scientists who responded to the crisis. I was as close to the well as any scientist could be. This cauldron of oil that's flying out of the bottom of the ocean floor. Four weeks after the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, oil hit the Louisiana coast. The first few days of the major impact, it was, uh, it was you know, mind-boggling. Uh, everybody just could not believe how much oil was on the beaches. In an effort to break up as much oil as possible, almost two million gallons of dispersants were sprayed onto the surface of the water and directly into the escaping oil. By the time the well was capped, 87 days after the blowout, hundreds of communities and millions of people were affected. We smell fumes from oil. Is it safe to stay here and breathe? Can we get in the water? Can we walk on the beach? People were looking for answers, and I think that that was a very difficult time because we were still trying to research and, and uncover what had truly happened. This was really a catastrophic disaster, but it was uh, from a scientific point of view, this is an incredible opportunity to really understand how the ocean responds, how the system uh, really functions. What ran through my mind first was, let's go out and get some baseline data, we at least have some measurements about what was uh, there before the oil. When I heard about the oil spill and I realized that, that the blowout occurred at 1,500 meters deep, I knew that we didn't have any baseline data for the large fishes in that area. To discover what happened, scientists from around the world turned their attention to the Gulf of Mexico. A whole research community has developed. It's composed of engineers, it's composed of chemists, biologists. We all get to work on pieces of this very big puzzle. We're trying to see if we could come up with new, unique methods to understand the oil pollution process. In controlled experiments that we perform in a laboratory, we try to answer these questions. Every dive, I've seen something new that I didn't know before. We discovered processes and organisms and microorganisms that are new to science. I mean, good grief, how, how incredible is that, that your job is to discover things that no one's ever seen before. Today, an international team of researchers are focused on the Gulf of Mexico. These are some of their stories. Intimate portraits of research, innovation, discovery. Stories that speak directly to a nation still recovering from the largest oil spill in U.S. history. Stay clear of the brown water tracks. We'll go ahead and light off the bow thruster. The Weatherbird 2 is on the second leg of a two-week cruise. At 115 feet, it's one of the better equipped research vessels working the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Its current mission is to collect and analyze fish and soil samples near the site of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And that'll be up in the site DSH-10, which is at a depth of 1,500 meters. Dave Hollander and Steve Morawski are leading a team of oceanographers from the University of South Florida. Valley, which is a very important area. Working closely with the ship's captain, Brendan Baumeister, they've spent weeks developing their itinerary. 
we're really interested in the fish uh, all along the uh, area north of the Deepwater Horizon because... Because time aboard the Weatherbird is limited and expensive, their plan is to divide into two teams and work around the clock. Okay, well that'll put us in a few hours behind, so it looks like we'll probably arrive to the first fishing site like mid-afternoon tomorrow, All right. which will give you time to do... Running so. behind schedule and with the clock ticking, the team is facing one other time-related problem. Though the spill happened six years ago, Gulf Coast communities are still pressing scientists for more information, more answers about the environmental impact of Deepwater Horizon. If you travel south, through the back country of Louisiana, eventually you'll arrive at a point where the land begins to join the Gulf of Mexico. And then it soon becomes obvious. In this part of the world, everything and everyone is tied to the rhythms of the sea, including shrimpers like Donald Dardar. I've been shrimping for over 40 years now. My dad was a shrimper, and his dad was a, well, they were shrimpers and crabbers and trappers. Shrimping has been in my, my family for for four generations, and it's just all we've ever done, and the way we've always supported our families and, and made a living. It's wonderful. I mean, it's just you on, you on boss, and you don't, you don't have nobody to answer for. For crabber Timothy Luke and thousands of other watermen working the waters of the Gulf, the oil spill changed everything. It's just scary how one little pipe in the middle of the Gulf could change so many lives and, and, and rearrange things in a way that you could have never imagined. What's at stake is not only a way of life. It's the future of one of the most biologically fertile regions in the world. A place whose waters provide 40% of the commercial seafood caught in the lower 48 states. The Gulf's coastal wetlands and marshes are home to thousands of species of plants and animals. And its beaches help support a hundred billion dollar tourist industry. But after 87 days of oil spewing into the Gulf, the beaches and salt marshes were hit hard. Hundreds of thousands of marine animals and birds died. All of our tourists left, everybody evacuated, basically left, didn't want to be here. A lot of just unanswered questions created a lot of fear and concern. Fear and concern, empty beaches, unanswered questions. Caught in the middle of a public debate was the scientific community. Our role is primarily to look at the weight of evidence of what we've got and then come up with the most reasonable explanation for the different things that we're actually seeing. And what the public saw were oil slicks covering 65,000 square miles of the Gulf, stretching from the salt marshes of central Louisiana, across Mississippi and Alabama, into the Florida Panhandle. The Weatherbird motored through the night, putting the research team back on schedule. Traditionally, every scientific cruise is given a nickname. This one is called the Mud and Blood Cruise. Steve Murawski's team is getting ready to catch fish. Though working in the field is never easy, August can be particularly brutal. It's 8 a.m. and the temperature is already approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It will be a very long day. What you're seeing is a long line fishing operation. Uh, we're setting out five miles of baited hooks. There's 500 hooks on that set. Their equipment is similar to what the commercial fishing fleet uses, except for one key difference. At the beginning and end of each of the long line sets, you put this recorder on. And what it is is a temperature and pressure recorder. This is the recorder itself. You can see it's quite small. It also has a clock in it. So it tells us exactly when we set it out and when we retrieved it. To help with long lining, Tia Clark and Jorge Hernandez join the crew. When not working aboard the Weatherbird, they are, in fact, commercial fishermen. 
We're trying to catch a representative sample of the fish community in this particular location off Southwest Pass, uh, Louisiana, but we fished uh, all over the Gulf. We fished almost 200 different locations. The team's ultimate goal is to track the recovery and health of fish. This is a very confusing place because if you look around us, there's a tremendous number of oil facilities. The numbers are staggering. 4,000 gas and oil platforms, 25,000 miles of active pipelines, and 22,000 natural oil seeps, all contributing to an oil-soaked underwater environment. And so we're trying to basically disentangle the Deepwater Horizon effect from all the other background. And so that's why continued studies of this is so important. For some, this is a rare moment of downtime until the lines are ready to be pulled in. That's when the field work really begins. But only if there are fish on the other end of the line. The team will know in about two hours. Not very far from the weather bird, a smaller and faster vessel is also in search of fish. However, the scientists aboard do not use baited hooks to find their prey. Oceanographers Will Patterson and Joe Tarnecki are about to launch an ROV, a remotely operated robotic device with cameras and data collecting right. sensors. There are 27 sites here that we've been studying now for about a decade. So we had a long time series of data before the oil spill, and now we've been revisiting them since the spill. So Joe will fly it from inside. Got it? Got it. ROV is in the water at 10.05.41. All right, we're at about 100 feet now. How you doing, Joe? Just approaching the bottom now. Not oh, the look yellow. at that, look at that. Yeah, cool. It's a big stingray. That's a big ray. What kind is that, Will? Is that a southern? I didn't see the front of it. I think it's a southern. Probably a southern. Yeah, it looks pretty here today. We should get some good footage. One of the perks of being an oceanographer is having a front row view of an extraordinary world of diversity. But the team's primary mission is to study the impact of oil and dispersants on both natural and artificial reef habitats. There's a red snapper. I mean, we just got it, scaled him with our lasers. When the ROV is close enough, Joe aims two parallel laser beams at the fish, called scaling it's how the team determines the length of reef fish. The lasers that we have are set at 10 centimeters apart. So that's about four inches. So when we go back, we can grab frames of the video. We can measure the distance between the two red dots and then get an estimate of the, the true length of the fish. That's important because for many of these fish that we have on these uh, coastal reefs, they're small young fish, less than 10 years old. And for many of these species, we can estimate their age from their length. We can also estimate the weight of the fish. It's a great way for us to gain information about the fish without having to bring them up to the surface and potentially killing them. After the oil spill, the team discovered that the population of the reef fish community dramatically decreased. But they also found that within a few years, their numbers rebounded to pre-spill levels. Yet there were profound changes. On average, the fish were now smaller and weighed less than before the spill. Well, there's lots of different ways to, th to think about impact of oil. So one thing that we've been looking at is growth rates. And we've seen in the years after the spill that for a few of these species for which we have quite a bit of information, that they're smaller at age than they were before the spill. So just because their numbers are similar to what they were, um, doesn't mean that there's no chronic impacts in the system. But then Patterson and Tarnecki's work got a bit more complicated. We had another issue dating back at 2010, 2011 with the, with the emergence of uh, lionfish. There's the lionfish. These guys are invasive exotics. Um, they showed up a few years ago here in our area of the Gulf of Mexico. It's unknown actual, the, the ultimate um, source, whether it was uh, a hobbyist that dumped their aquaria or whether it was a facility 
that release lionfish, um, but they were here because of the aquarium tree. Among fishes, lionfish are the most successful marine invaders that have been documented. They're very voracious predators, and their numbers have grown exponentially in four years. The team made one other discovery. The red snapper were competing for exactly the same food as the lionfish. This created an unexpected problem. We did some work last year where we tagged uh, red snapper with acoustic pingers and then mapped their distribution. And what we found is that the red snapper stayed farther away from reefs with lionfish, so it costs more energy for the red snapper to try to find a meal. So there can be these indirect effects. The aggressive and territorial nature of lionfish, compounded by an already oil-contaminated habitat, presented a major challenge to one of the most important fisheries in the Gulf. For the team aboard the Weatherbird, lionfish add another layer of complexity to their red snapper research. Here we go. The first four hooks come up empty, but Murawski is still confident. So generally we'll catch about 50 or so uh, on a 500 hook string, so nine out of 10 should be uh, empty. Uh, you can see that there's no bait left. That's a good sign. That means the fish are at it. Oh, red snapper. Come on, Chris, you can get him. You can get him. All right. Oh, a double. Oh, oh, that's a nice one. It doesn't take long before the deck of the weather bird is covered with red snapper. From the animals that you see coming up, we're taking about a dozen different tissues, body parts. They include things like the inner ear stones of the red snapper so we can determine their age. We're taking liver samples, bile samples, muscle samples, and in some cases, spleen, liver, heart, and brain. Double, 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 double. 48. Susan Snyder is a graduate student at the University of South Florida. I work with the bottom drawing fish that we're catching here looking at their present day exposure to oil and any long-term accumulation in their tissues. We take the bile uh, to look at any exposure within the past couple days to oil compounds, and then we take other tissues like muscle and liver to get the long-term accumulation of oil in the tissues. We know we're killing animals, but the point is, in order to do these kinds of studies, we have to do this. There's no other way to do this with photographics or anything. This, this, is, this is basically fishery science. This is a male. Amy Wallace is a PhD candidate, also at the University of South Florida. To study fish at, around the time of the oil spill, you need to be able to tell what they're eating, were they in the area of the oil spill at the time of the oil spill, and if so, how did they change and move after that? I'm taking mussel and eye lenses and um, otoliths from the fish. This is an otolith, it's the ear stone, and when we break open their heads, this is what we're looking for. All right, next one. Once you preserve them, you get back to the lab. This is where you're generating your data. Today I've been cutting otoliths on the isomet saw to cut out the center section so that I can get the most material from the otolith. And then at that point, I'm gonna put it under the microscope which will give me the fish's true age. What's great about this job is what you see. It's being out here on the water and being able to see things, not just the snapper and the fish that we pull in. Um, you just never know, uh, besides what you're working on, what you're going to see, um, whether it's on the line or off the line. Oh, oh, look at him, look at him, look at him. Look at him, he's, he's after him. There's a big shark there. Oh, see, he's got him, he's got him. That's a black tip. The team also gathers information about sharks to share with other scientists. I'm taking some um, yeah. thin clips of the sharks for some of the species for um, Dean Grubbs at FSU. Whenever possible, they return the sharks to the Gulf. Got it. That was an outstanding haul. We got a lot of uh, red snapper. That'll give us a, uh, a number of things. Uh, first of all, a really good look at the contamination levels, the tissues, the blood, uh, but also we're trying to form the age composition of the population. So with so many red snapper, we can, we can see which ones are the threes, fours, fives, and six-year-olds and what level of abundance. 55. 
So what we're going to learn from this is basically what the levels of contamination are. Some of the fish are, are quite contaminated and they remain contaminated and they're, they're among the highest contaminated ever seen. Some of the other fish, uh, the, the contamination levels have dropped significantly, like red snapper, and you know that's a good thing. The problem comes in when you actually have exposure to toxic chemicals, it results in things like liver cancer and uh, uh, you know, long-term genetic changes and, and other things that may affect the long-term viability of these populations. And that is exactly what scientists at the University of Miami are looking at. The genetic impact of oil on fish. This is a larva of a mahi-mahi. Take a closer look. This is what the failing heart of a fish looks like. The story of that larva begins here, where the Gulf Stream nears the shores of Miami, Florida. This morning, a team of scientists are going fishing. They're after mahi-mahi. Their goal is to replenish breeding stock necessary for their research. We cannot do the work without the broodstock. And uh, what we're looking for is, is basically young, young adult animals that are sexually mature, uh, but not too big to handle. And then, as I said, it all starts here. That's what we're doing today. And the target is to collect one or two males, or bulls as we call them, and then uh, you know, a handful or perhaps more cows. We are now, I would say, maybe 15 miles offshore of Miami. We're probably in about 1,200 feet of water. This time again, we look for birds. Any excitement by, by birds here typically means that there's a school of mahi or other predatory fish that's pushing bait fish to the surface. If we see birds that are kind of excited about something in an area, we'll run right up and, uh, and we'll start fishing that area. There's birds right ahead there. You're gonna wind a little bit, get their head up. He's gonna kind of jump, jump a bit. Okay, hold it. Right there. Another one. Right there. So the mahi, you'll notice, are, uh, they, they have a yellowish greenish appearance. When they come out of the water, it's because they're stressed, they've been fighting against the hook. So we get them into the tank as soon as possible, and in order to help them recover quickly, we pump their oxygen into the water, and it really helps speed that recovery process as well as keep them alive so that we can get them back to those land-based tanks and spawn them in captivity. So um, what, what we have now probably is at least one bull and four or five cows that are in good condition, uh, but we can't be sure that all these fish make it. So what we're hoping to do is get another one or two confirmed bulls and whatever cows we'll catch with that. So we're gonna, gonna push through for another batch of fish and hopefully that'll get us what we need. We've discovered a number of things that, that are somewhat alarming or concerning, uh, including uh, impaired swimming ability of these animals when they're exposed to very, very low concentrations of oil. So the big question is obviously what, what was the cumulative impact of these exposures on the early life stages and the adults where we see sublethal effects on swim performance. It doesn't take long before they find another school of mahi-mahi. Yeah, that's a bowl. Nice. Oh, that's... Yeah. Watch out, Layla. When the team catches enough fish, they head for home. As soon as they dock, the scientists begin the process of transferring the mahi mahi from the onboard holding tank to a carrying sling. A relay team will bring each fish to a nearby holding tank on the university campus. Their goal is to get the fish back into water in less than a minute. The objective is to maintain a stress-free and healthy environment for the fish so they'll feed and spawn naturally while in captivity. What we see here, these fish are about four months old. We feed them about twice a day. 
to satiation. We try and replicate what they eat in the wild and provide them with a balanced nutritional diet. This is probably the one place in the world that you'll be able to see mahi-mahi, this many of them in captivity. What you can see here is that they are ferocious feeders, which is why we're getting some of the very, very high growth rates that we, that we find in these animals. Up to about 30% uh, growth rate per day in these animals, which is about as high as it gets for any animal or any fish in, in captivity. We also sample the, the tissue frequently and compare that against uh, the tissue from wild fish to make sure that the body composition really matches that. So, because in terms of the experiments we run, we really want to make sure that these are a good example of fish you would find in the wild. In a few days, the newly captured fish will begin to spawn. Their embryos and offspring will be used in two separate studies. One of the things that we're focusing on in particular is the ability of these animals to swim in sustained uh, high aerobic activity. Just a few steps from the spawning tanks, the mahi-mahi are tested for endurance. In here we have a swim tunnel, which is basically a treadmill for fish, where we can also monitor uh, the metabolic rate while we're looking at their swim performance. The equivalent would be if you place me on a treadmill and you exhaust me or exercise me, my cardiac problems would manifest themselves in poor performance on this treadmill. We can do the exact same thing uh, with mahi-mahi and other fish species in the lab. The bottom line though is that mahi-mahi exposed to oil at certain concentrations during certain life stages uh, are not able to swim as well as unexposed animals. And swimming performance uh, is critical obviously for capturing prey, therefore being able to ingest food, and also uh, critical for being able to avoid predation, avoid larger animals. In a second study, the team discovered yet another serious problem. So what I'm doing right now is looking at larval mahi-mahi, specifically at their hearts. And the reason why we're doing that is because we know that one of the primary targets of oil toxicity is the heart. The larvae that we have here today, we got from the experimental hatchery that we have across the street from our campus. We find that with uh, oil exposures to mahi-mahi, they have uh, specific impacts to their heart and also have impacts on their survival at later stages of life and the capacity uh, of which they need their hearts to sustain high aerobic function. But I think one of the critical things that we've learned from the work and that, that one of the things that we're following up on is that in addition to the obvious effects of mortality during exposure to high concentrations of oils, uh, we, have, we have subtle effects that you cannot see uh, with the naked eye. You have to dig deeper and apply more sophisticated techniques to reveal these subtle effects. Surrounded by rugged mountains and the frigid waters of Prince William Sound is the picturesque fishing village of Cordova, Alaska. This is a place teeming with wildlife. Supported by a thriving herring fishery, not very long ago, Cordova was among the top 10 fishing ports in the United States. But all that was before disaster struck in 1989. It's being called the worst oil spill ever in Alaska. The supertanker Exxon Valdez, loaded with nearly 53 million gallons of oil, ran aground One off of the America's Colorado. most magnificent waterways is blackened and befouled tonight by the biggest... An oil tanker in smashed into a reef near Valdez, Alaska today, causing the worst oil spill since the Alaska pipeline opened 12 years ago. Ultimately, about 11 million gallons of crude leaked from the Exxon Valdez oil tanker, devastating nearly everything in its path. Among the few bright spots was the herring fishery. Everyone thought Cordova was spared. And in fact, the fishery did reasonably well for the next four years, until something totally unexpected happened. The fishing village of Cordova was hard hit. A mainstay of the local economy, the herring catch, disappeared. Fishermen from Cordova, Alaska, say that lingering effects from the oil spill have caused a sharp decline in herring. 
Four years after Exxon Valdez, the herring fishery suddenly collapsed. That's something we would call the latent effect. There, there wasn't any evidence of a potential disaster right immediately, but in the years that um, followed the spill, it became evident that there were some impacts. We need to be cognizant that sometimes these events take, take a while to work their way through the ecosystem. Um, many of these animals are long-lived. Uh, it takes a number of years for you know, baby fish to um, recruit to the spawning populations. Larval fish uh, are much more susceptible to contaminant chemistry and contaminant exposure than are adults. Subsequently, if larval fish and even juvenile fish are more uh, severely impacted by contaminant exposure, then as they become adults, those populations suffer dramatically. Adult fishes, they're able to swim away from a potentially a, a damaging or a threatening situation. But again, larval fishes, and particularly eggs, are planktonic, so they are going to be wherever they were spawned or released by the adults. And if that was in the oil, then they were definitely going to be impacted at the time. So why should we care about an 11 million gallon oil leak that happened in Alaska 27 years ago, when today the Gulf Coast states are still coping with the aftermath of a more recent 200 million gallon oil leak? I think the biggest issue that we have in terms of, of learning from Exxon Valdez is to expect the unexpected. For example, in the years that we've been sampling since the Deepwater Horizon event, we've seen relatively poor production of juvenile red snapper. Now, is that just natural vagaries of the stock? Is there something to this in terms of a, a response to um, potential for oil pollution? We don't know. Uh, what we can do is monitor those stocks and see if there's some kind of correlation. So we need to be, have a healthy skepticism about um, early declarations of no harm. To the casual observer, it's hard to believe that the world's ninth largest body of water is still under stress. The flotilla of boats surrounding the BP blowout site is gone, and oil exploration has resumed in the Gulf. Tourists have returned to pristine beaches. Commercial and recreational fishing boats are again working the waters of the Gulf, and the seafood is safe to eat. So what happened to over 200 million gallons of leaked oil? Government scientists estimate that 25% was burned or siphoned off, 23% reached the salt marshes and beaches or stayed in the water, and 52% evaporated into the air or was dispersed. But it was the use of dispersants that quickly caught the attention of the news media. Deadly mix. Did the chemicals used to break up that oil in the Gulf do more harm than good? Little is known about the effect of these chemicals applied in such great amounts. The EPA insists dispersants are biodegradable, but many locals worry their community could become another love canal. I just don't know that anyone can say today whether dispersants was a good choice or a bad choice. Uh, it may have probably or may have been the lesser of evils, uh, only time will tell did the dispersants actually have a long-term effect on uh, our ecology and environment or not. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University are developing innovative ways to see how dispersants interact with the ocean. We have some unique facilities that enable us to simulate oceanic conditions in a very controlled laboratory setup. This information then will go into large-scale uh, field models that actually try to predict the fate of oil. Essentially, I built the wave tank from scratch. It's a 20 feet long wave tank, and it can generate from non-breaking waves to very violent uh, breaking waves. And it's amazing. The wave tank enables scientists to study exactly how naturally breaking waves split oil slicks into small droplets. But when dispersants are added to the oil slick, high-speed cameras capture the interaction. The result is remarkable. The oil is broken up into microscopic droplets, which mitigates many of the adverse effects of an oil spill. The Deepwater Horizon event was the first oil spill in which they actually went down with a submarine and injected uh, dispersant into the, into the oil that was coming out of the earth. 
And so we're trying to simulate that process, uh, looking at how that dispersant breaks the oil up into very small droplets. When you have an oil well blow out on the bottom of the ocean, you almost have this, this cloud or this uh, smokestack of oil that's rising from the bottom of the ocean. And as it rises, it gets swept by the current. And so I built a towing tank to try to simulate that process. Um, and so we're looking at how that dispersant breaks the oil up into very small droplets, and then looking at how those droplets rise much more slowly, um, and how, how that interaction changes the structure uh, of the plume, um, and that that ultimately affects where the oil goes. What happens to, uh, after an oil spill? How fast the oil disperses, how much of the oil is going to end up in the marshes, how much of the oil will settle to the bottom. We need to answer those questions. Otherwise, we don't really have tools to predict, and then we don't really know what kind of tools do we need to develop to mitigate the adverse effect of oil. Despite the use of dispersants, about 47 million gallons of Deepwater Horizon oil reached land or stayed in the water. Its impact poses a lingering question that scientists are still trying to answer. Chris Reddy and his colleagues from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution have been filling in some of the blanks. My whole career has been studying oil spills, and at the end of the day, I think about oil as a bunch of different molecules, and I'm interested in where all those molecules go and how Mother Nature attacks them. I try to go out and collect as many different oiled samples and try to figure out who's winning this, this war of, of nature versus oil. I'm supposed to be a chemical oceanographer. I'm supposed to, people think I travel all over the world and seafaring. I just rented a car, drove 45 minutes, pulled up on a beach, and I'm going to be doing my field work within, you know, 100 feet of, of the parking lot. We're going to start looking for samples they have a little orange glow to them, about as big as a ginger snap cookie. So from a distance, you could almost think it's this, but it's not. That's a shell. That's a sample from the deep water horizon right here. That's one. That's not. Boom, 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 boom. If you were walking on this beach, I don't think you would know that this is from Deepwater Horizon. So I'm going to pick it up, put it in a jar. So it'll come back to my lab up in Cape Cod, and I'll do some initial studies to get a feeling for what's going on. And then I'll send a portion of this down to um, Tallahassee, the high field magnetic lab with my colleague, Ryan Rogers. I am an analytical chemist. Um but I do petroleum analytical chemistry. Chris Reddy and myself have been working with pre-blowout samples that were collected from the pool of oil that's way below the surface. And we analyze the petroleum. Essentially, we create a library of everything that was in the oil before it went into the Gulf of Mexico. The Highfield Magnetic Lab uses a, an instrument that has a magnet that's 20 times stronger than an MRI. So if you think about how we can study human bodies with an MRI, think about how we can study the chemistry of the oil with an instrument that it can interrogate 20 times stronger. Through Chris's efforts of collecting samples when they wash ashore on the beach, what we've been able to do is watch sunlight and bacteria chewing them up. What I've been seeing more recently, that a lot of the oil compounds that we would have thought might have lasted a decade, um, maybe only lasted about a year. The sun has done a remarkable job of, of breaking down these oil molecules much, much faster than I would have thought. And to me, it has uh, added a whole new appreciation about how powerful the sun can be breaking down oil in the environment. You know, we still find oil on some um, beaches, but it's very trace amounts. And, you know, we know there's some oil in salt marshes um, in Louisiana. But after that, it's really hard to figure out whether or not there's any, you know, identifiable oil. And so, obviously, you have to keep looking. Like Chris Reddy, Mandy Joy is also looking for answers. She's an oceanographer from the University of Georgia. 
Her team of researchers studies the environment in the most remote parts of the Gulf of Mexico. This is different too in that the, the little beads at 600 were, were larger. Mm -hmm. These are little tiny, like tarball size. Places where oil seeps naturally from the vast pools of petroleum locked deep beneath the sea floor. I'm a microbial geochemist. That means that I study microorganisms, the little tiny organisms that you need a microscope to visualize. You can think of them as these little microbial worker bees that live in the ocean and they carry out critical processes that make the ocean function and keep the ocean healthy. Over the years, Joy has visited numerous sites where animals have adapted to an oily existence. places where microscopic organisms eat tiny droplets of oil. These natural seeps are incredibly diverse and they're teeming with life. Every single dive is filled with wows and ahas and holy cows and can you believe that? Oh my God, look at this, look at that. But ever since Deepwater Horizon, she has experienced very few holy cow moments. There's a lot of dead worms and debris from the water column. In 2010, Joy and her team were aboard the research vessel Atlantis, several months after the blowout. Operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Atlantis is one of the most sophisticated research vessels afloat. The ship's hangar carries a unique vehicle, a manned submersible called the Alvin, famous for its voyages in the deep ocean, including the exploration of the Titanic. For this cruise, the Alvin will take Joy to the bottom of the Gulf, to a location just over 5,000 feet deep and two miles from the site of the oil spill. Her goal is to visually confirm what the team's remotely operated equipment discovered. Instead of rising to the surface, a significant amount of oil now blankets vast areas of the ocean floor. All who board the Alvin remove anything that might scratch the surface of the submarine and take off their shoes, leaving them on the catwalk. It's a reminder of those working thousands of feet below. Diving to bone-crushing depths and frigid temperatures introduces inherent risks on every dive. But I've never been afraid um, because these guys, the ship's crew and the Alvin crew, they're excellent at what they do and you feel perfectly safe in their hands. After a final visual inspection, the dive begins. It will take the Alvin about one and a half hours to reach the site. Once there, Joy will have an unparalleled look at the ocean floor. It's not a pretty sight. The Alvin's ultraviolet camera is turned on. Wherever there's oil, the sediment fluoresces in eerie green. The bad aha moment was when we really started looking hard at some of the animals. We saw oiled and dead corals. We saw oiled and dead sea fans. All the filter feeding organisms were clearly impacted by the sedimented oil. A sea fan that's a few feet tall could be 500 years old, been happily surviving and is now covered in brown slime and is dead. These organisms who filter feed and who are, who are not selective filters, feeders, they're not gonna spit the oil out. They're gonna just filter whatever comes past them. Um, they're, they're being damaged. We saw two crabs, both of which had the darkened carapaces and they all were just covered in these, in these barnacles. And when we brought that crab up, uh, we picked some of the barnacles off and, and looked at them under the microscope and their guts were filled with this orangey, oily looking residue. That to me was a very just sort of somber message. The dive to the bottom of the Gulf confirmed Joy's worst fears. She found oil 
and lots of it. Since the oil spill in 2010, Joy has made 17 such dives to the floor of the Gulf. And along the way, a question she is often asked is simply this. Nearly six years after the blowout, what is the state of the Gulf? The answer is we don't know fully yet. I think in, in many aspects, the, the, the Gulf is certainly resilient and it, it, has, it has responded incredibly to, to this very, very large and significant perturbation. But I do believe that there are things that we don't know the answer to yet. Back on the weather bird, long lining for red snapper is over for the day. And the mud team of the mud and blood crews has taken over the main deck. David Hollander and his researchers are launching a device that collects sediment samples from the seafloor. Uh, what we have here is the multicore. Uh, this is a device for taking sediment cores from the ocean basin. Uh, it goes very deep. Uh, we can also take sh uh, cores in a much shallower environment like we are here. There's eight cores around a central column, and this central core actually penetrates into the seafloor, and then when we pick it up from the, with the winch, it actually closes both the caps on the upper and lower side. The team's investigation was motivated by the earlier and unexpected discovery that as much as 10% of Deepwater Horizon oil now covers vast areas of the sea floor. You got it? So why are we doing both sediment coring and fishing on the same cruise, which is sort of unorthodox? By us taking sediment cores in the same locations as we do the fishing, we're able to relate the evolution of the contaminants over time in the sediments to the changes that we see in the fish. It should take about 10 minutes to get down and about 10 minutes to get back. All right, we're in. What we're trying to do is track the vectors of contamination how it goes from the sediments into the fish, and then how long it takes for the sediments to recover, the contamination to decrease, and see how that parallels the contamination in the fish. The core sampling operation was successful. Each of the core tubes is filled with sediment. Okay. So what we do now is remove the cores from the multi-core. We make a decision about what cores are going to be distributed to what scientific groups. This is a sediment core that we just collected, and it's a fresh core. And what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna split it in half so we can see inside, we can take pictures and have a record visually how the layers look in the sediment core. Inside each one of these tubes, uh, this is the best visual representation of what we get in each one. Just by seeing the changes in color, we can get a really good idea of how the, the uh, oxygen depletion uh, is occurring as you go down core. It also gives us a really good idea of when certain events happened in the core before we even date it or do any other further analyses. So just a visual inspection in any geology is really helpful. What this is essentially is a, a record of history, or you could view it as a, a history book where you can peel back the layers or turn the pages back in the history of the Gulf of Mexico. So this could be anywhere from a couple of hundred years to present, each layer denoting a certain time. The Deepwater Horizon is going to be the uppermost window of time uh, that is accumulated in the sediment core. This is very, very fine clay, very organic rich mud. We're going to analyze it for chemistry. When the weather bird returns to Panama City, all of the samples and data collected during the two-week mud and blood cruise are carefully offloaded and brought to the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. That's where the process of discovery continues. All right, you ready?
This is the carbon dioxide uh, coming from the sample into the mass spectrometer. This is the reference gas for the nitrogen. Those are great pigs, actually. The chemical techniques that we use are essentially doing forensics on the events that are associated with the oil. How the oil evolved in the system and ultimately its impacts, its consequences, and its fate. Murawski and Hollander's team discovered that oil contamination transferred from tiny creatures that managed to survive in the oiled sediment to small fish that feed on those organisms. And then the contamination simply moved up the food chain until it reached larger fish, like the red snapper. But there is also some good news. The fish are fine. Um, unless people are eating things like gallbladders, there should be absolutely no uh, difficulty in terms of um, meeting public health standards you know, for fish muscle, fish flesh. So people should be confident that they're not eating tented fish. Our focus now is the impacts of sedimentary oil. And that was surely a discovery uh, that was unexpected. It was one of the unexpected consequences uh, of the blowout. Today, the scientific community is working together to push the boundaries of what we need to know about oil spills and what we still need to discover. Yet in the end, there are simply no easy answers, no quick fixes. It was never ever a thought that it would have been possible to, uh, to have to get out this business. He was born in it, you knew you were going to be raised in it and he was probably gonna, gonna die living in, the, in this business. The fear is, what if this ever happens again? How many oil spills can the Gulf take before it, it starts having more of a, a negative effect than what this one's already had? As exploration moves further offshore to deeper environments, these deep sea blowouts or any subsurface blowout of an oil well is the new breed of oil spills. What we're finding is that in many cases those wells are going to be over two miles deep. Much of that uh, deep water area re remains totally unexplored. There are many new species to be discovered. It's really on us to try to do as much as we can to try to understand and protect those animals that are likely to be highly vulnerable to these kinds of issues. You've got to be a science communicator. You've got to be a science advocate. You've got to be a science educator. And you've got to go outside the classroom and you've got to work with kids, and you've got to work with adults, and you've got to teach them about how the ocean and the Earth system is changing. In a world that is 70% ocean and interconnected by an increasing demand for energy, we cannot ignore the reality that the search for oil is a major economic issue of the 21st century. If it ever a light bulb went off in all of our mind, it was our economy is totally dependent on a clean, safe, usable environment. So that was the lesson that we learned, and to this day, that is still our biggest concern. This presents the scientific community with an enormous challenge. To help find the right balance between the search for new sources of energy and what nature can safely provide. Though separated by distance and culture, for the more than seven billion people who draw sustenance from the resources of the world, there are common bonds. Bonds that are renewed by each generation, bringing new ideas, new attitudes, new hope. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin. I've always been in love with the ocean. I have always wanted to work with it and be around it. I was raised uh, in a very rural area, uh, very close to a pond, and I spent most of my waking hours in that pond uh, netting out any aquatic organism I could get my hands on. I always loved the outdoors and was interested in science and animals. I used to work on my science projects with my, with my dad and um, we, used to, we used to build some pretty, some pretty fun contraptions. It should be noted I, I was a surfer and a surf rat when I was growing up, so uh, this was a, a logical transition for me. My father used to joke that the question I always asked when I was a little kid, when I was walking along the beach, is, is where the water came from that filled my footprints. Funding for Journey to Planet Earth was provided by a generous grant from the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Scientists working together 
to understand and restore the health of marine and coastal ecosystems. Additional funding provided by the Wallace Genetic Foundation. The greatest private pleasure comes from serving the general welfare of all. And the Farview Foundation, dedicated to finding solutions to a more sustainable environment.